Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, books behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy tells stories about the contributions of two often forgotten nations that fought with the Allies during World War II. First, he tells the incredible story of the Orzel, a Polish submarine which escaped the Kriegsmarine in the opening days of the war. Then he tells the story of Nortraship and the vital contributions of Norway's merchant fleet to the war effort. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. The German army invaded Poland September 1st, 1939, marking what most historians consider to be the beginning of the Second World War. The German army was joined by the Soviet army invading from the east on September 17th, and the country of Poland was overmatched and overwhelmed in about a month of fierce fighting. But they never capitulated. The government escaped to Britain, formed a government in exile, and Polish forces continued to serve the Allied cause in both the east and the west, on the land, in the air, and on the sea throughout the course of the war. And of all those stories of heroism of the Polish forces in the Second World War, one early story truly demonstrates the tenacity of a people who refused to be defeated in spirit. The Orzel incident of 1939 and the amazing escape of the submarine called the Eagle deserves to be remembered. The Second Polish Republic was established on November 28, 1918, following the end of the Great War. Poland immediately recognized that the newly reconstituted nation would have to defend its borders, and that included the creation of a navy. The Republic received six torpedo boats of the German Navy as war reparations, creating a token fleet to protect the Republic's 90 miles of northern coastline that included no major seaports. The Republic embarked upon an expansion plan, largely designed around being able to defend the Polish coast from the Soviet Baltic Fleet. While the Republic had ambitious plans, funding those plans was difficult during the period of the Great Depression. The Navy built two ports and commissioned modern warships built in France, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands, but funds were too restricted to develop the fleet that they sought. One answer came in 1923, when the Navy created a foundation, eventually called the Maritime Defense Fund, tasked with raising public funds to construct a modern submarine. The effort slowly grew to be more organized, doing everything from selling commemorative coins to collections via civic organizations, Boy Scouts, and churches. By 1935, enough money had been collected to consider a design. After considering other proposals, the Navy selected the Dutch Shipyard Union and commissioned two submarines, one built with the public funds raised by the Maritime Defense Fund and the other paid for by the state budget. To reduce costs, however, 85% of the cost would be paid in Polish agricultural products, mainly brewery barley. The submarines would be jointly designed by Polish and Dutch engineers and would be modern designs that included several innovations, like more reliable hydraulic controls and an all-welded design with frames on the outer side of the body, allowing more interior space. 84 meters long and displacing 1,110 tons on the surface, the vessels were well-armed for their size, including a 105mm Bofors deck gun and 12 550mm torpedo tubes with a maximum load of 20 torpedoes. Powered by twin diesel-electric motors, the boats would have a surface speed of just under 20 knots and an operational range of 7,000 nautical miles. The vessel built with government funds would be constructed in Rotterdam and be called the ORP, meaning uh, roughly Warship of the Republic of Poland, Seump, meaning Vulture, and the one built with the public raised funds would be built in Deskelda and called the ORP Orzel, or Eagle. The keel of Orzel was laid down in August 1936. The boat was launched in January 1938 and commissioned in February 1939. At the time, the Orzel was one of the most advanced submarine designs in the world. That, however, would not be nearly enough. When Germany invaded in September, the Polish Navy included just five submarines, four destroyers, one large mine layer, and a handful of smaller craft. They were significantly outmatched by the German Kriegsmarine. 
Realizing that they would be easy targets in the enclosed Baltic Sea, three of Poland's four destroyers left the Baltic Sea for England even before Germany declared war. The Polish submarines, however, were assigned to defend the Polish coast in an operation called the Vorek Plan, or Plan Sack. The submarines were to screen the Polish coast to prevent a German invasion of the coast and attack any German vessels bombarding Polish coastal fortifications. The submarines were instructed to conserve ammunition for significant vessels and to follow international law with regards to the sinking of ships, requiring that they notify unarmed ships before sinking. If the plan became unworkable, the submarines were to operate in the Baltic as long as possible and then seek to go to Britain or, in the worst case scenario, be interned in a neutral port. Eventually, three of the five submarines would be so damaged that they had to seek to be interned in ports in neutral Sweden, unable to make it to Britain. The mine-laying submarine ORP Vilk, or Wolf, managed the difficult journey to join the destroyers that had escaped to Britain. But the Orzel would have what British Prime Minister Winston Churchill described as the greatest adventure story to come out of the war. The Orzel left its sector for the Baltic Sea on September 4th, but was identified and attacked by two German M-class minesweepers. A depth charge exploded directly above the submarine, causing an oil leak and other damage. The Orzel escaped under the cover of darkness, but needed repair. Moreover, Captain Heinrich Kluitschkowski fell ill with a mysterious illness, possibly typhus or appendicitis. The captain decided to seek a neutral port, but instead of Sweden, he opted to head to Tallinn in Estonia, possibly because he was familiar with the port, having studied there. The Orzel arrived in the neutral port, with its medieval skyline, on September 14th. The Estonians, themselves trying to maintain their neutrality, may not have been happy to see the Polish vessel. But under a provision of the Hague Convention intended to prevent fighting in neutral nations' waters, a boat from a belligerent nation could stay in a neutral port for 24 hours. At first, the Estonians welcomed them. Koitschkowski was taken to the hospital, and they aided in repairs. A German merchant vessel was already in port, and by the rules of the convention, the submarine had to wait 24 hours after the vessel left before it could leave, which extended the stay to 48 hours. But the next day, an Estonian naval officer with an armed guard arrived and informed the first officer, Lieutenant Jan Grudzinski, now in charge of the crew, that the Orzel was to be interned. Pressured more by the Germans than by the law, the Estonians started the next day to disarm the vessel. They confiscated all the navigational charts, the crew's sidearms, the ammunition for the guns, and they took down the Polish flag. There was a brief visit from the British naval attaché, but the Estonians wouldn't let him on board. He managed to slip his business card to one of the Polish sailors. On the back was written, Good luck. God bless you. Grudzinski and the crew decided they did not want to remain in Estonia. They formed a plan. Grudzinski kept up a show of cooperation while the crew prepared. While 14 of the 20 torpedoes had been removed, on the 18th the crew sabotaged the ropes of the equipment needed to remove the stern torpedoes, delaying the Estonians for another day. A crewman spent the 17th fishing in a boat, which the Estonians considered not threatening and allowed. Under the guise of fishing, he sounded the harbor for an escape route for the submarine. At nightfall, the mooring cables were cut halfway through. The plan was to leave at midnight on the 18th, but an Estonian officer arrived, suspicious, and stayed for nearly an hour and a half until he was convinced that the crew was not planning anything. Finally, at around 3, Grudinsky gave the order to attempt the escape. Crewmen surprised and overpowered one Estonian guard atop the conning tower of the moored submarine. In the control room below, a second guard found himself staring into the muzzle of a revolver. Soon both were bound and gagged. Crewmen wielding axes quickly cut the electrical cable the nearest searchlight and the telephone wires. Next, they finished cutting through the mooring cables, and the Orzel moved away from the dock. The dramatic escape occurred just 17 days after Adolf Hitler had triggered the Second World War by invading Poland. But the boat quickly ran aground on a sandbank, and the Estonians, alerted to the escape, started shooting with machine guns. The searchlights came on, eventually finding the boat as artillery fire began from port fortifications. Luckily, the fire was inaccurate, and the boat received only minor damage. Grudzinski reversed the engines, and the submarine pulled free and made for deep water. She spent the following day on the bottom, now hunted by the Kriegsmarine. In the escape and the Estonian fire, her radio equipment had been damaged, and the boat was now more than 2,000 kilometers from Britain. Much of that was teeming with enemy vessels looking for her, and she had no navigational charts. Grudzinski headed for Sweden, where he could drop off the two Estonian guards they had taken. The German and Estonian press declared them dead at sea, but they were actually provided with clothing, money, and food. Grudzinski hoped to capture a German merchant vessel and take its charts, but the only ships they encountered were warships. A German plane attempted an attack, but the submarine managed to escape into deep water. They were sighted once by a German vessel, but apparently mistaken for a Swedish submarine on a neutrality patrol. Grudzinski was determined to fight on as long as he could, but no targets presented themselves. 
With the ship low on fresh water and damaged from the escape, including a bent propeller shaft and damage to her directional steering, he decided to make for Britain. Without charts, all they had was a list of lighthouses, which they used to navigate along the Baltic coast and around Denmark. On October 14th, the boat reached the coast of Scotland and, submerged to avoid attack by the Allies, managed enough emergency repairs to the radio to send a message. The British were stunned, assuming that the Orzel had long since been sunk. A British destroyer escorted them into port. 43 days after they left port in Poland, 26 days after their daring escape from Tallinn, and 8 days after the last units of the Polish army had surrendered at home. In port, they were welcomed by Henry Kaminsky, captain of the OPS Wielk, the only other of Poland's five submarines, to make it to Britain. The extraordinary escape and journey of the Orzel was announced by the Allies in December, providing much needed good news for the Allies during a difficult year with few successes to tout. The Orzel was repaired and ready for service on December 1st and began patrols as part of Britain's second submarine flotilla. On April 8, 1940, the Orzel encountered a German merchant vessel called the Rio de Janeiro. When the vessel tried to run, Orzel sank her with torpedoes, becoming the first Polish ship of the war to sink an enemy vessel with a torpedo. Unknown to the submarine at the time was that the ship was part of Operation Visirobung, the planned invasion of Norway. The boat was on a secret mission and was full of German troops, and the rescue of survivors might have warned Norway that an attack was imminent. Unfortunately, by the time the information worked its way through Norwegian channels, it was too late to be helpful. The Orzel continued service with the second submarine flotilla until June, when, while on her seventh patrol, the brave vessel, which endured such an adventure, simply vanished without a trace, along with her entire crew of 54. The Polish government managed to escape to Britain and form a government in exile, and with them they managed to take the country's gold reserves, which financed their efforts throughout the Second World War. The Polish Navy, supplemented by ships that were leased from Britain, made great contributions to the war in the Atlantic. They participated in the action to sink the German battleship Bismarck in 1941. They escorted convoys in the Battle of the Atlantic, and they supported the invasion of Normandy in June of 1944. The Soviets asserted that the Estonians must have helped the Orzel to escape and used that as a pretext to force a treaty upon Estonia that allowed the Soviets to build bases in Estonia. Later that year, the Soviet Union invaded and occupied Estonia. Estonia would suffer greatly during the Second World War. An estimated one quarter of the population of the country died in the conflict. The original captain of the Orzel, Heinrich Kloivskowski, eventually was captured by the Soviets in Estonia and then managed to make it to England after the Soviet Union joined the Allies. He was tried for desertion for his actions in taking the Orzel to Tallinn, condemned in a letter by the remaining officers. He was convicted and dismissed from the Navy. The disappearance of the Orzel is the great mystery of the Polish Navy. It's generally assumed the submarine must have run into a mine, but without finding the wreck, we can never know for sure. Several expeditions have been sent to try to identify the wreck of the Orzel, but the North Sea is a vast graveyard full of wrecks from the two world wars. And as of the filming of this episode, the wreck of the Orzel has still not been found. It seems that the greatest adventure story to come out of the war has ended with a question mark. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind the scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. So, you know, this is such a great story, and, and I think for, for a lot of people, I mean, I think it's surprising that Poland even had a submarine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great story. I mean, they, uh, Poland knew uh, that they were in between powers that wanted their <laughs> stuff, uh, and they only had a little bit of coastline to defend. Uh, and a couple of submarines, I mean, you know, trying to build a navy that could defend against whether, you know, the Russians attacked or the Kriegsmarine attacked or whatever uh, would have been an awful lot. But uh, a couple of submarines can really give you pause, especially when you're talking only, was it something 50 to 90 miles of coast or something like that yeah. there? Uh, and, but, I mean, the foresight to, to build a good quality modern submarine, and they built the two of them, uh, really is, uh, I mean, it was, you know, for its day, it was more modern than the submarines the U.S. was using at the time. Uh, and that, you know, that was a lot of foresight. But, but I mean, you know, in the end, it didn't do much to forestall the attack. But on the other hand, it couldn't. I mean, in that the attack came from Germany across land. Yeah. And so that the Orzel wasn't going to be able to do much. But uh, that, you know, it shows what they thought of the submarines, too, that they essentially told the rest of the Navy to flee. And they told the submarines, you know, hang around, cause havoc. I mean, that's what submarines do. Do but, what you can, yeah. yeah. It's a good, it's such a good story too. They had, a, you know, they had to raise people's dimes and pennies to do it. They had, you know, very little money yeah. after the end, uh, and that they 
that whatever, 75% of it was in agricultural trade. So they were trading beer barley uh, to, <laughs> to, the, to the Netherlands to build their, their submarine for them. That's a, that's a really good story. They literally trade yeah. submarines for beer. Yeah. Yeah, Poland. Uh, Poland definitely knew that they were they were in a precarious position mm -hmm. there in between various powers, and of course, I mean Poland had been fought over for uh, yeah, centuries. For centuries. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. it really had only kind of gained back its its countryhood in yeah. the Treaty of Versailles. It had fought the war with the Russians in between there too, because there was the yep. the, the, the Soviet uh, Polish War. Uh, and so, I mean, they uh, you, you were a brave lot in Poland because I mean, but you'd say that too about Denmark and Norway and and uh, yeah. Belgium, and there were countries that are you know compared to the large belligerents of the war, they knew that they were you know at best roadblocks, stepping stones, uh, and yet yeah. they still tried to preserve their integrity and in their nation, uh, even though they knew they were outnumbered and and uh, in yeah. in various ways, in different ways. Yeah, Poland. I mean, Poland did its best uh, with what they had, especially. I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, they become a country in, in like 1919, mm -hmm. and then uh, they faced uh, – there was there was destruction from World War One, and then, then they fight with the Soviets, mm -hmm. and then the Great Depression. And yeah. <laughs> it was rather diffi a rather difficult time to build up an army, especially build, it's, for It really from scratch because there was no military yeah. prior to that. Yeah. Nothing, they, yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's uh, – uh, you know, there's, there's actually a lot of great history in Poland, and you can certainly say that they were brave fighters, and that really showed on, yeah. on the Orzel. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, ultimately, they were uh, – ready to do what they had to do and yeah. it's it's impressive uh, it's impressive that they were willing to it's also impressive that you know poland as a country was conquered quickly yeah and yet the poland as a as an identity and as a force yeah. to fighting in the war remained for you know the uh, fact that the, the, the government war. made it out with all their gold is <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a great story i'm sure that the germans yeah. are like ah Jason. but uh <laughs> it's uh, that but that was that was how you know that was how Poland was able to. Yeah, they did. And they, you know their their forces, their land forces, also fought quite bravely during the war. Their air forces fought quite bravely with the RAF. So it wasn't just the Orzel. Uh, their their destroyers, uh, you know, operated in the North Sea Patrol and the and the uh, for the entirety of the war. So that, I mean, a lot of, of things. But the, you know, just the story of the Orzel. One of the things about it is early in the war when the Allies didn't have a lot to say. Uh, the Orzel escaping was a good piece of news at a time when they didn't have a lot of good news. And so at the time, you know, this was a big deal. This was, you know, the escape of the Orzel. Now, I, you know, I doubt very many people really remember the, the Orzel outside of Poland. Uh, and that yeah. was one of the reasons that I told the story, because it certainly deserves to be remembered. That escape from yeah. Palin is just, a, it's a wonderful story. And uh, it, Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. That 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 alone was was worth telling, but it's it's also I mean you're right that, that people have forgotten this uh, truly heroic mm -hmm. uh, effort by these people who were the whole time uh, you would not have necessarily held it against them if they had no uh, no matter of fact the captain <laughs> the captain of the vessel uh, you know with a stomachache yeah. you know went to essentially was willing to surrender. Uh, but the rest yeah. of the crew apparently had stronger stomachs, and they, yeah, they yeah. no one would have if they had just followed orders there in Talon and unloaded their torpedoes and then gone into internment, uh, which would probably have gone bad for them. In that you know Estonia ended up being you know Soviet zone, and then the yeah. Germans chased the Soviets out. That was terrible, uh, and then the Soviets yeah. came back, and you know it was I mean it, the it, whole it thing, was yeah. a terrible place to be during the war. Uh, but uh, no one would have blamed, blamed them if they had just gone into internment. Uh, but instead, they came, and the, you know the plan is great. I mean they sabotaged the equipment so that the, they couldn't get the torpedo out so that it stalled, stalled it another day and then they had a they had an officer there and they had to you know they had to bs Hanging this out, officer yeah. until he left and then they uh, and then they took the two guards they what they left the two guards in sweden eventually right yeah. so they, gave them, <laughs> they gave them a boat and some money and said there you go dude uh and Good luck. Uh, yeah and uh, you know that they you know they escape under fire uh so you yeah. know who knew that the estonians were shooting at the poles during the during the second world yeah. war that that, that actually the fight would occur but yeah, they, yeah it's, they they planned all that and you know they had a guy out in a fishing boat who was actually sounding the harbor and i mean it's just a, it's right, a yeah. great story they're very very clever yeah it's it's an absolutely incredible story of the, their tenacity and mm -hmm. i mean just the desire to you know do something yeah. for the war effort yeah. and for the fact that you know Poland was uh, World War II was in a lot of ways an ideological war too, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Germany was very willing to wipe out the Poles, and uh, the Poles said, you know, that's yeah, we're not that they, let you do that. But they held to so our tightly to their national identity throughout the war yeah. is is extraordinary, and and yeah. you know, so then they, the the. Uh, uh, the Polish brigades, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the Polish uh, Airborne Brigade served at, uh, at Market Garden, uh, yeah. and the, 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 the Polish was at the Polish division in the, in the Italian campaign. And, yeah, I mean, they were, they were brave troops, the, the Free Poles, and, uh, and yeah. continued to, to resist long after the country fell. 
the Estonians, who admittedly come off a little bit as the villains in this one, uh, were in a oh yeah, equally they, difficult spot. Never had a good, <laughs> a matter of, you know for them. Uh, if the Orzel escapes, it's going to appear to the you know to the I guess they're in the Russian zone at that point. It's going to appear yeah. to the Russians that they and that's exactly what happened. The Russians yeah. use that as a pretense to invade Estonia. So I mean I think they knew it was on the line too. I mean I, I don't think that they were yeah. they were the bad yeah, guys. I don't I don't blame. They, yeah. Hard to blame the Estonians for for shooting at yeah, them. They they're trying to do everything they can to say, look, we we didn't. Yeah, let that we them didn't because to, to, they're trying uh, to act like a neutral country to try to maintain yeah. their neutrality. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was ultimately for, and lots and lots of countries did that. I was doomed for anybody who was essentially in the way of these larger yeah. belligerents. Yeah. Uh, I, that was, which is unfortunate. And well, it worked and for... Says, I mean, the Soviet plan always was to take those oh, Baltic yeah. states. It always was. Yeah, they were never... Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, they were, they were always, you know, just something where, you know, the dragons are on either side of them waiting to gobble them up. Yeah. Yeah, and that was true. And for they're free Latvia now. Latvia and yeah. Lithuania. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the uh, but I mean that you know there's only a handful of countries really that were able to really truly remain neutral, especially in Europe. I mean, says like yeah. Spain, Sweden, uh, Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. And they were uh, th there were particular reasons for that. Although honestly, I still think that you know given enough time, probably. Germany would have turned turned to dealing with those countries, but that's a completely different uh, question. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the nature of the war was why they wouldn't have attacked them. And it's interesting yeah. that Spain remained neutral, especially since you know, the it's... relationship that they had. And uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think you were in a position. Uh, of course, uh, Ireland was neutral during the, yeah. during the second. Oh, that's war. right, that's true. But uh, but I mean, they they were in a position where they could do that. But you know, obviously, as a matter of fact, even even Ireland, there was still talk about you know Germany invading Ireland so that they could invade the UK from there and stuff like that. Even those states that you know managed to geographically have a distance yeah. uh had still work kind of, you know sweden you know was able to maintain neutrality because germany needed their iron but had sweden resisted they certainly would have taken yeah. them uh yeah, switzerland you, you neutrality you know they were so surrounded by axis power so their yeah. neutrality was only kind of sort of neutrality uh and, and that you would talk about them being kind of somewhat german aligned uh only because at the, i mean they were utterly dependent upon germany for yeah. any of their stuff to move so i mean uh, uh, uh on the other hand you know uh uh, they because they're such a mountain state, it would have been more cost to uh, militarily attack them than it was worth. I mean, they, they certainly couldn't have resisted Germany, but I mean, they, they uh, you know, uh, they would have been able to make a, a much better stand uh, given given the nature of the of yeah. the country. So, you know, it's just a matter of what you know what it was worth to the to the Germans. Yeah. So yeah, neutrality was not easy uh, in a lot of places. There were a lot of places that wanted to be neutral that couldn't. Belgium. Uh, did not want to have a part in the war, and they, you know, they, they didn't uh, have a choice. I, to be Poland honest, I'm sure Poland countries and... did not want a part in the war. Yeah, uh, yeah. Poland would have rather not been a part it's, of the war. It's interesting. But, you know, that's the... you know, the whole war starts because uh, because uh, I don't know. There's lots of ways you can put this. Some people will disagree with me on this, but I mean, it really, what it ha happens is is Britain and France thinks that Germany is not willing to risk a widespread war over Poland, and that's why they signed the, the, uh, the, the Mutual Defense Pact uh, on the idea that if we just, you know, if, we, if Germany knows that if they attack Poland, they're at war with France and England, oh, they'll never attack Poland. Uh, and, yeah. you know, obviously that was a tad bit of a miscalculation. You know, there, was, yeah, there we, were actually we, some British uh, uh, troops that had just arrived in Poland for, like, training to, you know, coordinate, and, the, and you know, they're escaping now. They're escaping all the way through Europe and yeah. stuff like that to get home. And, well, France and England were clearly not ready for the war. Yeah, I mean, well, they, they didn't think it would reason. But, and, you know, and they're in the position, because if you prepare for war, then that's the excuse they use to go to war. But if you don't prepare yeah. for war, then, and, you know, the Soviets ran into that same issue. You know, they couldn't, uh, Stalin couldn't prepare for war without provoking Hitler. Hitler was going to attack anyway, but when he did, the Russians were less prepared because Stalin was afraid that he would provoke Hitler. And, yeah, I mean, you know, in the end, it's very difficult to stand in the middle and say, no, I don't want to be any part of this, especially if you have something people want. And, you know, a, part, a big part of Hitler's early agenda was to rebuild the German Empire to take back what was lost in the Treaty of Versailles, and that included Danzig, and, the, and he demanded Danzig, and he demanded the travel route to Danzig, which would have cut essentially Poland in yeah. half. Uh, and he was probably always going to demand that. And so, you know, Poland really yeah. never had a chance. I mean, which, if you give up like, your territorial integrity of like the Sudetenland, then he's just going to yeah. take more because he can't. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was they, that 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 ended up being the the same because he, he was trying to do that the whole time. And in some ways, I mean, you know, you can look at it now and think uh, he was always looking for a bigger war. Yeah. And that's uh, everyone else, just, you know, Chamberlain and everyone just kept stepping didn't think, back. Didn't think that they would. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and yeah, with but, their experience uh, with the Great War, you can see why they didn't they didn't want war. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, and they didn't want the intermixing, you know, this the whole the whole tangling alliances that led to the First World War. And before you know it, though, this is this is where we were at. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you're we're, right. We're Poland, kind of telling it from a Western perspective, too. That's also fair. Yeah, that's the, also the true. The Germans yeah. would make a different argument about how they were forced yes. into a war that they didn't want. And, yeah. uh, we're historians. I mean, we, you know, what happened happened. And what happened was Poland was invaded. Poland had a, a navy. Uh, that navy wasn't large, <laughs> but it was fairly modern. Uh, and okay. they managed to remove most of the Navy intact, including the Orzel, which was an incredible story. Yeah, that's that's really quite impressive that the, the destroyers and stuff were all able to make it out. Were able to, it. yeah. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, the, the Germans had submarines too. <laughs> so, uh, yes, it is uh, extraordinary. Yeah, they had a lot of submarines. In those, I mean, that was a time when the you know, probably the most important part of the war was the Battle of the Atlantic and having those uh, having those destroyers, which were which continued to serve convoy escort for the whole war. Yeah, was, I mean that was a huge thing. It was that was very very useful. Uh, it is yeah, it is so the... tragic what happened to the yeah. Orzol. It is it's tragic that after getting out and all it did that it goes on the regular service and you just find out that submarine life is dangerous. Never know what happened to her. Yeah, yeah. and that's I mean that was true of so many submarines. Yeah. And you know the Orzol has a had a yeah, somewhat higher a profile because it was you know only the one two and it was a yeah. famous submarine. Yeah, uh, but we said they've been trying to find the Orzol since. Uh, and yes. at, I think three, different, at least two, maybe three different times, they found a submarine yeah. they thought was the Orzol and found out it's just another submarine. And that's how many submarines yeah. have been lost in the North Sea that they didn't know where they are. I mean, those were, yeah. obviously, they didn't know what they were when they found them. So those are other submarines that had gone missing during you know, the First and Second World yeah. Wars. And... Yeah, there and there's still many, many submarines that we don't know what happened to them. Yeah. Uh, there's so many different things that can happen to a submarine that mm-hmm. ends up, you know, and ends up at the bottom of the, the bottom of the sea and you might not even know the general area. I don't know if we, other than the North Sea, I don't know how specific we know where the Orzol was lost. I don't. I if they had better plans, you think they would have found it by now? Because there has been yeah. a, a few times. Do you find such a concentrated effort to find it? Because this is yeah. so important to to, uh, to Poland and its history. So, and there, you know, there's another concentrated effort going on. And I, I, I you know, I have all the hope that they will find the Orzol because it's an important piece of history, yeah. deserves to be remembered. And those 57 men. You can't bring them back, but I mean, uh, you know, their yeah. their descendants at, at least deserve the right to know what happened and where. Yeah, I don't know. It's something I'd I'd like to know too. Would be an interesting. I you know we we wouldn't have that question mark at the end of the Orzel story. Yeah. Um, we're we're not sure, other than probably it hit a mine, which I mean that's. So so I, I mean, there's other think there's other things that could happen. Uh, I, oh, yeah, I think absolutely. that you know it lacks a German report that suggests that they you know encountered yeah. a German warship or something like that. But I mean, so they're you know their guess is it hit a mine, but yeah. uh, you know, which is know. which is a, a fair guess. Um, but maybe we'll be able to find that out if we find the the wreckage. Um, I, I do like that you know this one has a has a connection to to our. Uh, our next story because mm-hmm. it managed the orzol manages to uh yeah. fight and sink that ship that was on its yeah, way to that Norway. was its major its major you know aside from escaping yeah. and getting out was that it sank yeah. a uh, transport that was carrying german troops uh that were preparing for the invasion of norway yeah, so it's interesting that there's it probably connect, yeah. some significant cost in yeah. terms of german uh material yeah, and, lives and, 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 and you know the germans are having to hide that that's even going on because yeah. they don't even know want anybody to know what's in the ship so which yeah, is that, the whole reason the ship, why they ended up sinking it yeah, that's yeah the, the ship turned out to be more you know important than they would have guessed yeah yeah, and that was that was a uh, you know as we've talked about with Poland, that's it's a better revenge. Similar, yeah. similar with Norway too, and the it's in a the better uh, revenge. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. similar with Norway too, another country that didn't you know didn't ask for war and was hoping for neutrality, and was desperately trying to be yeah, neutral. Trying, yeah, yeah, that was uh, uh, another one of those difficult stories. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Yeah, I was, uh, I enjoy true crime. Uh, I really do. I enjoy stories where they just tell the story of, you know, a, a crime and a criminal and how they caught him. And uh, it's an interesting piece of history to me. There's some, some things that are kind of lurid about it. So I was just kind of popping through true crime. And I, I saw this series. It's kind of funny because I didn't really expect what it was going to be. But I saw the series and it's called The Suspects, uh, On the Loose and Dangerous. So the, I, I thought that it implied that these were suspects who hadn't been caught. And it's not. It's actually more of a traditional true crime where they tell stories of, of uh, crimes that occurred and, and they in, in, uh, interview the detectives on how they found the criminals. But the, the anything, interesting thing about the suspects, it takes place in Australia. 
uh, and they oh. they are uh, they're really digestible. There's three there's three crimes per thirty minute episode essentially. So you you know it's only about ten minutes, so you can really you know it's pretty snappy. And oh yeah, kind of like a history guy episode. And they're they are uh, they're almost comically Australian crimes. So <laughs> I say I really I only watched the first episode. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I you know I'm an American. I'm a Yank, so I do find some just uh, just some entertainment in Australian accents and things like that. But I mean it's it's stuff wouldn't happen in the U.S. That's what I would say. <laughs> And uh, it was a lot of fun as far as true crime goes. Uh, it's it's almost in between cops and uh, and you know something like on the case or what some of the shows that we have yeah. going on here. It's as fun as any cr true crime series I've ever seen, simply because they're they're dealing with you know really you know stuff that's just you know offbeat on what what the crime would be. So and there's just there's a ton of true crime on there. Uh, and uh, if you if you enjoy true crime, if you you know if you want to figure out why you know why women kill or whatever, then uh, uh, that's uh, just as broad and amazing as their history collection is uh, and their space collection and their nature collection they have a true crime collection too so if you want if you want one where you know you, you don't have to spend an hour to see who done it if you want one where you can you know uh, then I, I would i would really suggest that the suspects on the loose and dangerous so uh that i, I had fun watching that what, what what have you been watching lately on magellan tv so one of the ones i watched recently which was absolutely crazy and totally different it's called river jaws evolution of the catfish and i wasn't sure exactly what to expect from it but what i learned is there's a there's a kind of catfish that lives in europe it's called the welsh catfish native to like eastern europe mostly uh, now they're found all over the place apparently uh, mostly because they've been introduced people take these things uh, and have just put them elsewhere so like they're in france now <laughs> but these catfish they've found these particular group of them that are eating birds they wow. are coming actually out of the water and eating pigeons, uh, which is apparently a very strange behavior for a fish. So, so like they walk out of the get up? They, they, <laughs> they like, they kind of do like what a, what an orca does. Oh, okay. Oh, so they jump out of the water. They just grab stuff at the, at the water's edge, uh. Uh, which apparently is a, is a, can be a bit of a problem because yeah, they can get stuck up there, but apparently it's a good enough hunting at the pigeon, the, wow. the pigeon holes that, uh, so yeah, it's, they, they well, were that's totally a new behavior. Yeah. I'd never heard of that. I'll tell you the truth. Wild. I knew that we had catfish in North America. I knew they had big catfish in South America. I have never thought of European catfish, but I mean, it makes sense. But European bird eating catfish. Bird and they're an invasive. Catfish. This is, this is in France. This is where they're an invasive species. What an extraordinary yes, story. Although who knew? They, they actually, they talk some interesting stuff about just how invasive they are. They apparently don't do damage really to the local ecosystem so whether they're invasive or not <laughs> unless is you're a pigeon <laughs> <laughs> unless you're a pigeon but of course you might not care yeah, yeah, if, you're, no. if you're the people you might if, not care if everybody the thinks or... they got plenty of pigeons yeah no one no one's like oh i'm missing the pigeon that the, the, the catfish yeah that's the, they're like oh well pigeons. it doesn't seem to be you know having an effect on the pigeon population i'm like yeah probably not that's <laughs> I, I don't know is it good uh, uh, does it taste like chicken if it's uh, and you know it is a catfish, right? So I mean, it is a catfish. It's appropriate that it's eating <laughs> it's birds. birds. It's a com it's a really strange documentary. I was totally surprised <laughs> by it, and I I learned some absolutely insane things about I European have, catfish. I will absolutely have to look that one up. <laughs> Who knew? And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of the History Guy, you can always go to try dot com slash History Guy where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash history guy. Next up, the history guy tells the story of Nortraship and Norway's important contribution to World War II. Germany invaded Norway in April 1940 and defeated the Nordic nation in a 62-day campaign. But many Norwegians continued to serve the Allied war effort, serving from Allied countries like the United Kingdom and Canada as part of the Free Norwegian Forces, or at home as part of the Norwegian resistance. But it was a group of Norwegian civilians who had arguably the largest impact on the war. In fact, some have argued that without them, the Allies would have lost the war. The Norwegian government in exile formed the Norwegian Shipping and Trade Commission, called Nortraship to manage the Norwegian merchant fleet, and their little-remembered contribution was a vital part of the Allied war effort. It is history that deserves to be remembered. On the night of April 9th and 10th, 1940, German forces attacked Norway. The Norwegians were largely caught off guard, although they did sink the German flagship Blücher, and this delayed the Germans long enough for the royal family, government, and treasury to escape from Oslo. 
The Norwegian government in exile was headquartered in London, and Norwegian forces served admirably throughout the war. But Norway's greatest contribution to the war effort wasn't in strength of arms, but in tonnage of ships. When Germany invaded, hundreds of Norwegian-owned ships were scattered across the world. In the interwar years, Norway's merchants had purchased dozens of new ships, turning their fleet into the fourth largest in the world, and one considerably newer than anyone else's. As much as 65% of the Norwegian ships were less than 10 years old, only 22% of U.S. ships and just 7% of the U.K. merchant ships were that new. Norway held almost a fifth of the world's total tanker capacity. In all, the Norwegian fleet had some 4.8 million gross registered tons at its disposal. The relationship between Norway and Britain didn't start with the invasion. In World War I, Norway had been called the neutral ally thanks to its technical neutrality but British favoring policies during the war. Norway declared neutrality in September of 1939, but their position was always tenuous. The first Norwegian ship to sink was the MS Ronda, which hit a mine on September 13, 1939. They had trade relationships with both Germany and the United Kingdom, but Norway relied much more on trade from the UK, which provided grain, oil, and coal, and controlled dozens of international ports. Leadership in London knew that war would require much greater shipping capacity. With war with Germany looming, they hoped to gain control of, or at least cooperation with, the Norwegian fleet. Before they'd even entered the war, Norway and the United Kingdom had come to terms on the Scheme Agreement, which promised a percentage of the Norwegian fleet to sail under British charter, including about two-thirds of the tanker tonnage. In exchange, the Norwegians were promised important commodities necessary to keep the country functioning. In order to maintain Norwegian neutrality, the agreement was officially negotiated by the Norwegian Shipowners Association. During the seven months after the war began and the invasion of Norway, more than 50 Norwegian ships and some 400 crew were lost to German hunting. Denmark and the Netherlands both refused to sign similar agreements. Norway's neutrality was doomed from the start. Norway was especially valuable because it controlled a major supply of iron, especially from northern Sweden, that the Third Reich needed. On the same day it invaded Norway, the Nazis invaded Denmark, and a month later Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and France. Forces in Norway fought on until the 10th of June, longer than any other invaded country in the early part of the war. But by then, the UK was busy dealing with the collapse of Allied defenses in France. The founding of Nortreship itself occurred in a flurry of activity after the invasion. Twelve days after the invasion, Royal Mandate had confirmed government requisition of the entire merchant fleet, otherwise privately owned by Norwegian shipowners, many of whom were still stranded in Norway. On the 23rd, Norwegian government officials were dispatched to London, with control of the merchant fleet to be given to Ivan Lorentzen, a shipowner in charge of the shipping directorate. By the time they reached London, they found that much of the preparatory work had already been completed by Norway's minister there and Ingolf Hissing Olsen of the Shipowners Association. In fact, the offices at 144 Ledenall Street opened four hours before Lorentzen's arrival. Later, they would open other offices outside the city and in New York. Shortly after Norway fell, the Germans took over radio in Oslo and broadcast to the Norwegian merchant fleet that they were to make for neutral ports or to return home to Norway, but not to go to any British ports. The BBC immediately radioed out a counter-order, inviting the Norwegian vessels to come to Allied ports for safety, where they would be welcomed and receive compensation for their services. The creation of Nortreship was highly contested. The British still wanted to simply take control of the fleet, but the Free Norway government wanted to maintain its control and its independence. Without the merchant fleet, Free Norway had no means of supporting itself or its armed forces. One of the sticking points was who should insure the fleet, but after a few days and an incredibly short negotiation, the British were able to telegram captains that your ship is held covered by the British government against war and marine risks on the values and conditions under which she is at present insured. It was a remarkable achievement, apparently in less than an hour, mostly through Lloyds, without knowing where the ships were or what they carried. Admirably, not a single Norwegian ship obeyed the Nazi broadcast from Oslo. The fleet comprised around a thousand ships, from ocean liners and tankers to Norway's whaling fleet. It was one of the largest merchant fleets in the world and called itself the world's largest shipping company. Their position was fairly unique. Denmark, which had surrendered, had its ships essentially commandeered by the British, but Norway's government remained intact. Many of the decisions by Norway and Nortreship can be viewed through the dual lens of short-term military goal and long-term financial ones. They were called Allied and Competitor. As one book called it, they serve for patriotism and profit. Before the U.S. entered the war, Norwegian ships not chartered to the British took advantage of high market rates for shipping from the U.S. 
when the U.S. entered, months of negotiation eventually led to the Hogmanay Agreement, in which the Norwegian negotiator fought hard for Norwegian interests against both of the Allies. During the war, almost 90% of Norwegian government revenue came from Norter ship. The Norwegian ships sailed mostly in the North Atlantic, the most dangerous shipping theater of the war, although they served throughout the Mediterranean and the Pacific as well. The quasi-private entity ran successfully, but not without some significant internal frictions. Powerful private and government personalities faced off, especially that of appointed Lorentzen and Hising Olsen, who represented the ship owners. The problem was partially solved when Lorentzen was sent to the U.S. to deal with free ships, ones not chartered to an ally, and disagreements over who should keep the earnings from such shipping. The government stepped in to say that New York and London offices were parallel offices that ran their own ships. In the U.S., several free ship owners continued to cause problems. One of the largest was Thomas Olson, who insisted that he was most qualified to manage his own ships. One Norwegian government official called Olson's acts bordering on high treason. Those ships owned by ship owners who served in Norter ships certainly faced the moral dilemma of making decisions that might benefit them personally. Lorentzen himself received criticism, especially for continuing to run a line of his own ships in South America and appointing his son to a position in the New York office. Arling Dekaness, who negotiated the Hogmanay Agreement, was viewed suspiciously because he flew his own ships under foreign, mostly Panamanian, flags. In 1941, Norwegian ship owners formed an association to defend their interest. Partially, they feared that the government intended to nationalize shipping after the war, which the Norwegian government denied. There was also the issue of payment. Before the invasion, Norwegian crews received a 300% hazard pay. Afraid the pay difference would affect the morale of other Allied crews, Britain demanded that UK merchants and Norwegian ones be compensated equally once they joined the war. Eventually, Norwegian crews were promised only slightly higher rates. Joining the war, however, was dangerous. In the summer after the invasion, losses skyrocketed. In the next nine months, Norway lost 96 ships to enemy action and began to have problems crewing their ships. Norway negotiated for higher wages to offset the difficulties, first in 1941 and then again in 1942. The British continued to push for chartering all Norwegian vessels, but ultimately only took control of about 75%. These ships were vital. They helped to pull enormous amounts of lend-lease equipment across the ocean, to England and France, and then later to the Soviets, as well as tons of oil, gas, and food. It was also highly profitable for Norway. Shipping always comes at a premium in war, and Norter ship earned around 4.5 billion Norwegian kroner during the war, most of which was from shipwreck compensation, the rest directly from trade. Most of that money went to the ship owners for losses, but around 800 million kroner came back to the government, more than the entirety of their rescued treasury. In 1964, the government estimated the financial contribution from Norter ship to Norwegian society to amount to 1.2 billion kroner. When the decision was made to cut the Norwegian sailors' hazard pay, the UK continued to pay the same amount to Norway, with the difference being paid in a separate account, now called the Secret Fund. There seems to have been an understanding that this money would be paid to the sailors after the war, however this was not to be. After the war, the Norwegian government decided that 43 million kroner fund should be dispersed to the widows and children of seafarers that had died, as well as those disabled during the service. Sailors, however, were already pressing in court for their own claims to the money. The sailors' case was thrown out by the Norwegian Supreme Court in 1954. That wasn't the only example of poor treatment for Norter ship sailors. Some of the sailors had been gone so long that they were removed from voter rolls, while others were forced to do compulsory military service, their service aboard the merchant fleet deemed insufficient. Many of the sailors suffered PTSD, called War Sailor Syndrome, but were given much smaller pensions than soldiers who had been held in Norway during the war. Some politicians even argued they deserved no pension at all. Up to the 1960s, war sailors and their families had to prove their problems were a direct result of the war. It wasn't until 1968 that the burden was reversed and the government had to prove that the problems were not caused by the war. It wasn't until 2013 that the Norwegian Minister of Defense issued an apology. The story of our war sailors is a shocking narrative about a society that was not properly prepared to take care of some of the biggest war heroes, he said. The war sailors were eventually given money in 1969, amounting to 180 kroner per month the sailors served. One author writes that for the majority of the Norwegian population in Norway during the German occupation, the war years were a challenge of the more prosaic kind. Norwegian sailors and the Norte ship fleet had a different wartime experience. They were at war. Of the 1,000 ships and the 30,000 sailors that served at the beginning of the war, more than 500 ships were lost.
and some 3,600 sailors died, along with about 1,000 foreign crew members. About 10% of the total shipping tonnage lost in the war was Norwegian. The 3,600 dead made up a full third of total Norwegian casualties during the Second World War. Nortra's ship provided valuable service to the Allies during the war, providing supplies to both Britain and to Russia. A 1942 U.S. diplomatic memorandum noted that in 1941, 40% of all oil and gas and 30% of all foodstuffs sent from the Western Hemisphere to England were sent on Norwegian ships. Their role should not be understated, nor the risks that they faced. They served primarily in the most dangerous sea theater of the war, the North Atlantic, facing the dreaded German U-boats at the height of their hunting. British politician Philip Noel Baker, who served after the war as the Minister of Fuel and Power, said, If we had not had the fleet of Norwegian tankers on our side, we should not have had the aviation spirit to put our Hawker Hurricanes and our Spitfires into the air. Without the Norwegian merchant fleet, he argued, Britain and the Allies would have lost the war. So, you know, these two these two stories combined, I mean, they both tell the stories mm -hmm. of countries that uh, fought as hard as they could, yeah, but, but ultimately occupied, yes. yeah, didn't uh, have much of a chance against the forces. Norway was a very different uh, battle it than was, Poland. Yeah, and Norton um, Shipboard, I mean, it was a very different story than the Orzal, but still what it is yes. is these are at sea when the when the war starts, the country is occupied, they uh, managed to continue to serve. Uh, and in both, uh, of course, in both cases, the governments escaped. So you had uh, governments in exile. Yeah. And, but I mean, Norton yeah. ship is, I mean, it's a different story too, because I mean, they're, they continue to act as a merchant line. Part of this whole yeah. story the whole time is that, you know, the efforts to nationalize them, uh, when they, when they want to say, well, you know, there's a war on this, is, this is profitable. Yeah, this is, <laughs> there's ways for us to make money. We can here. charge you more. <laughs> yeah. Very dangerous. And of course, I mean, you know, we learned that through this episode. So uh -huh. a lot of these ships were sunk. And but how, especially as a tanker fleet, because uh, tankers were always yeah. at a premium. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I don't think that most uh, Americans, I don't think a lot of people I know that study the Second World War realize how critical yeah. the, the ships of Norway were in maintaining the, uh, the in the Battle of the Atlantic yeah. and maintaining the trade. Uh, and uh, the, I don't think that, you know, you, you know, we think about that. I mean, there were Norwegian troops in exile, too, and, you know, like the Polish troops yeah. in exile. Uh, but uh, that this this really was a major contribution to the war effort that is very much underappreciated and you know, nearly yeah. forgotten history. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of the one of the things that when we think about wars, you know, and what they write, what they do documentaries on and stuff, it has a lot to do with battles. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the exciting part of the war. But, you know, well, they were part of the Battle of the Atlantic. They're part of the, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, they yeah. don't really talk about the You know, the merchant ships are not usually the thing that you see the documentary. Yeah. on. Yeah. Even though they are constantly, you'll you'll hear them, you know, in the list of things that were sunk and tonnage that was sunk, yeah. is that they were they were very much a part of the of the war effort. And I yeah, mean, their life is very much at risk. And you know, in, yeah. in a ship that's not very well defended, I mean, you might have a small yeah. gun, you might have a small gun crew, uh, but I mean, you are you are a uh, legitimate war target, even yeah. though you're not really a legitimate war ship. And yeah. that's the you know, they're brave lads. You were being hunted by some of the most, you know, some of the most dangerous ships mm -hmm. uh, in the world when you had that those wolf packs and the submarines, the German U-boats that were going mm -hmm. around. I mean, they were they were deadly, and they sank a lot of ships. And that was the that was the whole Battle of the Atlantic. You talk about uh, how important that battle was, and that that you know, in some ways, that battle, which lasted pretty much the whole war, may have been the, one of the deciding, one of the main deciding factors. Yeah. Is that we were able to continue it's, to it's described as the longest stuff. battle of the war uh, I, I yep. mean uh, you know there's people will disagree with that if you look at the campaigns in the pacific but this time is the longest continuous battle of the war and and really one of the largest battles in history was that battle of the atlantic yeah. and uh, it was still being fought very much contested even at the end of the war that we had all these methods for fighting submarines and the submarines were still taking ships you know up till the day yep. of surrender yeah yeah and it's a uh, it's it's just an incredible story uh, again, and you know who knew? Just like we didn't know that you know Poland had a, had a submarines, uh, who knew that Norway was such a significant uh, merchant fleet before the war? Yeah, I mean they had like a fifth of to of all tonnage, and especially in their tanker fleet. And this mm -hmm. was something that you know n don't necessarily think about. But all the countries uh, knew that that kind of stuff was going to be vital, mm -hmm. uh, and it was the only way that we were oh, able yeah. to. I, think, I, mean, I mean, I think one of the reasons that Germany yeah. uh, invaded Norway is that they they knew. I mean, because in, in World War One, Norway was neutral, but they were a huge assistance to the Allies. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that might, I mean, they, the, no matter how they talked about it, I mean, the bottom line, it was easier for England to blockade Germany than it was for Germany to blockade 
trade England. And so that meant that those trading partners who were more likely to be, I mean, it's true of the United States too, were more likely yeah. to be conducive to England. But I think one of the reasons for invading Norway was to prevent that fleet, to prevent that, uh, that, you know, that massive, and you know, it's, it's not a surprise. I mean, this is <laughs> the Vikings, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, they, um, they'd use ships to go all over the world and actually, yeah, you know, they, were, they were still uh, doing that. Much of England was occupied by people from Norway, right? I mean, that's that's uh, the descendants yeah. of them today. But I mean, I, I don't I had no idea that Norway, uh, you know, prior to this episode, that Norway had a, a, a fleet so large, so vital. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah. that, uh, you know, initially the country falls. Uh, and the orders that they get are, you know, come back here so that you can be interned. Uh, and they, none yeah. of them, not a one of them chose to do that. They all. That's, I mean, that's just an incredible, you know, the fact that they heard that and they all were like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Although at that point it was also, I mean, pretty hard to be, to want to go back to the, the, the Nazis are like, oh, well, you have to come back and be here. It's yeah. like, yeah, you just invaded our country. I yeah, think maybe we yeah. <laughs> But also, you know, that I mean, it you still know, France, speaks to France, the... I mean, it was always a question what the Navy was going to do. And there were there numerous true. forces of France that when the country fell and the country capitulated, uh, you know, became, yeah. you know, loyal to the existing French government, even though it was not a collaborationist yeah. government. So they chose not to, you know, they chose to, they, uh, they chose to be free French instead of Vichy French. Yeah. And uh, and that's and He's that heard. made a difference in the war. It made possibly yeah. a critical difference in the war. The quote at the end, of, the quotation at the end of the episode is that yeah. without them, uh, the Allies would have lost. Uh, Britain would have fell. Would have fallen. It's an it's an incredible story. But I, I think that that's you know that speaks to how important it was that we could move uh, even before the United States really entered the war. You know, stuff when we were talking about uh, uh, sending what. Uh, sending supplies and food and things like that that was absolutely vital um, yeah well and those tankers because we were sending fuel. yeah those tankers That's yeah a, fuel i mean that was absolutely right we saw that in microcosm in malta where i mean the whole idea of the defense of malta depended upon whether you could fuel the spitfires uh and yeah. as long as they could fuel them they could defend the island and that's the same thing was true of england on the much broader scale you know the the, yeah. the petrol had to be moved in order for them to be able to, i mean you know yeah. if defense in the era gas, of the second world war required that you have fuel yeah, I mean that's it's an incredible to try to think that you know if the if the British had not been able to send planes into the air yeah. during you know the Blitz, <laughs> these are those it's, were I mean, and later in the war critical, because uh, because yeah. we had uh, cut the fuel plants and et cetera, then the Germans were yeah. not able to train their pilots and that started to show it with the Luftwaffe. And, I mean it all, yeah. that all you know makes a huge difference. There's no question that the Battle of the Atlantic was critical, and it, but there's yeah. there's really no question if you look at it that the ships of the of Norther ship were critical to the Battle of the Atlantic, yeah. and that's the piece that I. I think a lot of people don't know and of course even afterwards they struggled to get recognition even from the norwegian government for their service and the risk that they took it is an interesting you know because they talked about how they they fought you know for for uh patriotism and profit and you you can see in some ways why you're like oh well you know you weren't as committed to the war effort as someone who you know enlisted but at the same time i mean it's when you look at the numbers and when you look at what happened here i mean these these guys were risking their lives absolutely about one in and, ten of them died in the war right yeah, yeah so they were risking yeah. their and lives so as much as combat troops yeah uh, awfully difficult to say that they that they weren't uh, treated as as combatants and belligerents yeah, they, and they, yeah. they certainly were the whole time and they just didn't have much chance of shooting back most of the time I also think, you know, one of the interesting parts about this one, and we, we're really only able to go into it a little bit. There was a lot more, I, I remember, when, when researching this episode, but we, we talked about it somewhat. Uh, the rivalries between the, you know, between the the, the actual mm -hmm. ship owners and the Norwegian government. And then, of course, yeah, the uh, England government. the whole time yeah, yeah. was trying mm -hmm. to, the, the British wanted to, I, well, they wanted to nationalize the whole thing. They wanted to control it through the yeah, British, yeah, yeah. which I get. They, they, they feel much more confident that they'll be able to get their needs met. You know, yeah, the they British just want to treat them like, like British ships, yeah. Yeah. So it's an interesting, you know, they did that essentially to the, you know, the, the Danish fleet. Um, mm -hmm. But... It's it's really interesting they, to see some of these The Danish government had capitulated. They were they yeah. had become essentially a belligerent. Uh, they didn't have the yeah. government in exile, and so they could treat that differently. They could essentially take yeah. say these are war booty, uh, even though those you know those Danish ships, those people on the Danish yeah. ships were still you know sacrificing because they you know wanted to keep their country free. I mean, I, yeah. I think for the sailors it wasn't all that much different, but that you know that legal status was different. Uh, and England too yeah. just wanted to be able to do that. So and and. Uh, you know, a lot of the sailors were doing it for themselves and were surprised to find out that they received really little compensation for their wartime yeah. service. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and, you know, you'd say that of the American Merchant Marine, too. Uh, I mean, they, were, they continued to be paid to do what they were doing. 
it's always true too, you know, that there's that there's all these different uh, interests mm -hmm. because you see what the I mean, you know, that of course they're they're fighting for their country in the ways that they can and they're critical in the war effort, but also I mean. Yeah, Profit, of course, matters, and that that was something that some of them thought about. Mm -hmm. And for for the country of Norway, I mean, they were very aware that you know without the uh, without the merchant fleet, without any money coming into the the Norwegian uh, government's coffers, and of course the entire country of Norway was occupied at the time. They weren't getting anything from there. Uh, this was the only way that they were going to be able to continue to do anything for the war effort. Mm -hmm. And I. It's difficult. It's it's hard to imagine that you know when you if you lose your country like Poland did in 1939, come back six years later, and uh, try to reinstitute your government. You're talking about going back into a place where you you didn't have uh, you know your territory for all that yeah, time. And so the fact that Norway was able to at least you know make some money during yeah. that time for the government probably helped in, in yeah. the the yeah they uh, couldn't be taxing for that whole period. So that, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> at least I mean, they were able to. It was, like I said, I mean, the re one of the reasons they wouldn't let them nationalize and wouldn't let them just integrate it into the British merchant fleet yeah. is that the Norwegian government says this is the only way we have to make money right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was so impressive that how quickly uh, Norway and the Norwegian government was able to essentially put this together. Because I mean, they were doing it. Norway is Norway's being invaded, and again, the Norwegian government's able to escape thanks to which is another story that mm -hmm. that story where they sink the 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 or damage the the Blucher. Right. And <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole interesting story, too. It wasn't really what this episode was about. But they were I mean, within days, they, they had this, this concept ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then they were able to have uh, they were able to insure the ships despite, uh, you know, they were all over the world at that point. And so there's some really interesting the and those kind of, you know, seem prosaic compared to the some parts of the war. And yet those were all vital to keeping this part of the war efforts uh, you know in existence which, which was, was a critical point i mean it wasn't i mean yeah. this is not this is not something small that we're talking about we're no. talking about you know the you know whether england stays afloat so yeah i mean and in, you know in the end everybody worked with each other's interests uh in order to yeah. be able to uh to you know win the war so it is an extraordinary story but i mean they they, they need to be remembered as veterans they need to yeah. be remembered yes. as people who were risking their lives in order to contribute to the war effort uh, and who who did fight and die in that war as much as people who had joined the navy yeah and the, the idea that you know they were being they were being paid for their work and that's that makes it lesser is is a little hard to swallow it, when you it, it is it risks. is interesting though that a big a big part yeah. of it was the negotiation over how you get paid you know wartime rates for yeah. for operating these ships like yeah and, and, and they the, were complaining about that because they were getting paid too much more than the british merchants uh it was and that you know that was a whole problem and it's uh -huh. it's interesting how that all works it is i but, mean there were, you know, there's politics in war too and there's economics in war too and yeah. this is this is a microcosm of it but certainly yeah. it is history that is largely forgotten uh especially yeah. probably just outside of norway uh and that deserves to be remembered Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.